So um, the neocortex for a, uh, a human, um, your neocortex, uh, is often likened to uh, a folded sheet about the size of a dinner napkin. Uh, now, it's not, uh, it's planar uh, from a topologist's point of view, but it certainly isn't flat, even if you tried to flatten it out. Um, it uh, has been studied probably more than any other portion of the brain, uh, possibly because people think that it's one of the things that distinguish us from, uh, uh, from other uh, mammals. But uh, one of the things that was early on discovered is that it has a very regular structure throughout, both um, in a hierarchical sense, um, but also in terms of there being modular components. Um, and these were first identified at the anatomical level uh, by Vernon Mountcastle uh, and some of his colleagues back in the 90s. Uh, and they referred to these as cortical columns. And in fact, they invented a whole slew of, of, of columnar type structures. Um, the, the, if you look at the cortex from the side, um, you'll see that it's striated uh, in a number of levels. Uh, and those levels have been identified, and there's different types of cells uh, that are in each of the levels. Um, the, the circuitry uh, for those cells has been mapped out in some detail, um, and um, the, not only does it have a well-defined sort of structure with sort of a, a sheet, a, a laminar sheet on the top, which corresponds to um, a lot of connections. Um, it's myelinated. It's the white matter that you see on the top. Um, and another uh, sheet at the bottom, uh, which has additional connections. Um, and in between, um, there are these columnar structures. And I'm going to almost treat them as cartoons. Um, and there's some controversy about whether or not uh, the columnar structures are real in any sense. Um, but certainly, they, they, they are real in the sense that uh, an anatomists can pick them out by using the various kinds of stains. Um, so my cartoon picture uh, of the cortex um, is what's shown in the lower right, um, a set of columns uh, arranged on a, uh, a sheet um, with a lot of connectivity, both uh, bottom and top. Um, various areas of the cortex, specifically those having to do with the visual cortex, uh, have different areas. Uh, and those areas actually have mappings uh, that map from the periphery of the body, say from the retina, um, back to uh, the earliest processing areas, um, and then mapping from those to other processing areas. And, and each one of the maps uh, basically preserves a lot of the spatial characteristics of the original signals. So if they correspond to the retina, uh, then the patterns on the retina, um, that uh, points on the retina, cells in the retina that are close to one another are close to one another um, in area V1, the first area, visual area, V2, V4, uh, inferotemporal cortex, et cetera. They map through the cortex in that fashion. Um, don't ask me where V3 is. It's just, uh, it, it's not a mistake. Um, V3 just wasn't interesting enough to have a number, I guess. Uh, the processing that goes on between these areas uh, tends to have both a bottom-up component, um, where data uh, propagates up through uh, the layers. And so I often depict it as a stack, uh, but obviously it's not represented. It, doesn't, it isn't instantiated as a stack on the cortex. It's a bunch of plates uh, that are connected together. Um, what got me interested in this in the first place uh, was a, a colleague at Brown, uh, David Mumford, and one of his students, now a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, uh, developed a, a very simple, uh, elegant model of uh, processing in the visual or striate cortex. And uh, the idea was that, that data came in from the periphery of the body, um, either the data itself uh, or some um, uh, a proxy or summary of the data uh, was propagated up through the various levels, uh, and that constituted the bottom-up component. And the top-down component um, was in terms of expectations that were generated uh, by the data that's seen in the first place. And so the data um, often was incomplete, and the top-down component, the expectations in terms of prior distributions, um, allowed you to fill in portions of the data that weren't there. Um, 
And the idea is that these are the kinds of things that enable you to hallucinate uh, uh, or to, to fill in the details where uh, perhaps uh, the data is occluded in the case of vision um, or elided uh, in the case of, of text. So their model was something called a hierarchical model. Uh, it was uh, a, what's called a generative Bayesian model, uh, which is a, a whole school of statistical inference uh, due to a fellow named Ulf Grenander. Um, the particular way that they modeled the generative models was in terms of something called uh, a Markov random field, uh, but that's essentially a detail. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, various kinds of instantiations in terms of what are generally called graphical models, um, Markov random fields being a particular case. So uh, again, in the spirit of using cartoons in order to sort of understand the, the high-level concepts, uh, I want to start with uh, a very simple pattern recognition problem. And I want to use that um, in order to motivate the use of generative models. So suppose that we have uh, the task of recognizing or distinguishing between uh, uh, different kinds of buildings. And we only have two different, uh, two different buildings. We have uh, uh, garages which I'm going to tell you um, in this cartoon world, uh, consist of uh, usually one story building uh, with a shed roof and houses, uh, which are usually two story buildings, though sometimes they're one story buildings and they tend to have gabled roofs. Uh, we're going to divide the, um, the visual field up into four quadrants. Uh, uh, and those are usually termed receptive fields. Uh, and the idea of a receptive field was first introduced by Eubel and Wiesel, uh, where the idea is that there are portions, little areas on the retina uh, that map back to cells. And those cells are tuned uh, to various patterns. So uh, in our cartoon here, uh, the, the four receptive fields uh, are tuned to a number of different features. Um, and they can recognize the left pitch of a, of, of a gable roof or the left pitch of, that corresponds to one portion uh, of a shed roof, a right pitch, uh, a left two-story building, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is uh, a, a hierarchical model. It's a generative model. Uh, it happens to be also called a, uh, a, uh, a Bayesian network. And each of the boxes corresponds to a random variable. Um, the random variables uh, are indicated uh, as building, roof, frame, um, and then uh, more and more detail as you go down uh, through the hierarchy. Uh, the random vari variable building can take on uh, three possible values, house, garage, none, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, you can see that, that the variables high in the hierarchy essentially uh, are, consist of a composition of the features uh, that are at the next level uh, down. So what we want to do, uh, this, this in sense basically uh, outlines uh, the, um, the, the structure of the model. Uh, we also want to instantiate it uh, and provide um, a, a set of parameters uh, that allow us to make quantitative dis distinctions as well as qualitative distinctions. So uh, to add to the, the graphical structure of the model, uh, we're going to um, establish a set of parameters. Uh, and for each of the random variables, we'll give a conditional or marginal distribution. The conditional distribution is in the case of uh, variables that uh, have parents. Uh, and for variables that don't have parents, it's a simple marginal. So uh, the probability of building, that's our prior on whether or not we're going to see a building in the visual field. Um, and the prior on the, the probability of roof given building is just a conditional probability that says, if in fact um, we've seen a building, then what's the probability that we're going to see different kinds of roof structures? <coughs> One of the reasons that, um, that these models are used so much in statistics uh, and computer science and artificial intelligence nowadays is that they have uh, a solid semantics. So, with those distributions, the distributions on the previous page, uh, we can completely describe the corresponding distribution. Uh, and statisticians like that uh, because it's the, 
Um, it's the, the, the coin of the realm uh, in statistics. So what we want to be able to do is to describe a joint distribution. Um, and that's what the, the variables on the previous page allow us to do. But we're usually not interested specifically in the, in the, the, uh, the joint. We're interested in, in marginalizing out some of the variables and getting probabilities with respect to particular variables. So there's a process of inference um, whereby you can compute um, the marginal given some evidence. Um, and if the evidence is empty, uh, then you're still going to compute a marginal. Uh, and uh, this gives an in indication of what you would compute for a particular instantiation of the parameters on the previous page. So in this case, uh, what I've done essentially is uh, run an inference algorithm. Uh, I gave it some initial parameters. For example, I said that the probability uh, of, of, of a priori seeing a house is about half, uh, of seeing a garage is about a third, uh, and seeing nothing at all is about um, a fifth of the time. So uh, running the inference algorithm, uh, because of some subtleties in the way that things propagate, um, the, the distribution that results is not exactly that distribution. Um, and here's what you would get in, in what's called the belief function uh, for the case of the graphical model where there's no evidence. And it, again, it indicates that yeah, pretty much half the time you see a house. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, the upper left corner, uh, it says most of the time you're going to see a left pitch, which is consistent with the idea that we're, we're, we're looking at a house. Um, OK, anybody having trouble with understanding the basics of this, these models? OK. So now we can add some evidence. Um, and here, we're going to fill in the evidence for three of the quadrants and leave the other one to float. Uh, so the little boxes shown in red uh, correspond to the instantiations of those random variables. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, the data uh, sort of percolates up. Um, uh, and we see that the, the probability of there being a house is much higher. Uh, but the priors and the expectations also propagate down. Uh, and you see it's a much higher probability of there being a left pitch. Okay? So this is an example of, of, of both the, the bottom-up and the top-down inference uh, that these graphical models are capable of. Uh, and it also gives you an example of a kind of pattern recognition or pattern completion. We're shown a portion of the pattern. Um, it fills in the other portions of the pattern. There's a lot of tricks that are required to make it more uh, useful. Um, and in particular, um, one of the most difficult problems in machine vision, or for that uh, matter, in machine translation, uh, is deal with, with various kinds of invariants, uh, and in particular, translation and scale invariants. There's also compositionality constraints. So if we were to take the generative model on the previous page um, and do what's often done uh, as an example of, of a generative model is you fix the top variable, so you set it to be building, and then you sample from the distribution. Um, that is, you sample at the leaves. And the question is, what kinds of, of, of images would, would appear? And if you did, you, for that particular model, you get things that shown like that. So the pieces might be right, um, at least statistically. Uh, but obviously, they don't cohere in any interesting way. So uh, somehow, you have to add compositionality constraints. Um, you also might want to look at problems where uh, there are multiple instances of the same object in, in, the, in the image. In particular, you'd often see a house with a garage adjoining, um, and you'd like to be able to recognize that as well. In order to do that, um, you have to construct a more complicated model. Uh, and it's done primarily by adding additional dependencies and correlations between the random variables. Uh, but the basic structure uh, essentially stays the same. So we're talking about the cortex, um, not about uh, graphs uh, that you can draw on blackboards. Um, and the kind of connectivity in the cortex is of a relatively benign sort. Um, so they're on the order of 10 to the 15, excuse me, 10 to the 11th neurons, um, but only 10 to the 15th connections. Um, so this is usually referred to as a very sparse graph. Um, it has what's called the small world properties. Uh, essentially, uh, the, uh, the distance between any two nodes, uh, any two neurons in the graph is relatively short uh, because there's a, a blend of short range connections and long range connections. Um, this kind of connectivity um, is 
rapidly becoming uh, possible to model uh, on uh, cluster computers. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about in the remainder of the talk. So um, another aspect uh, besides the ones I just mentioned having to do with uh, the compositionality constraints and uh, dealing with scale and translation invariance is that really what the cortex is good at doing uh, is fusing data from multiple sources, um, handling multiple modalities. Um, it also allows us, basically the, the, the cortex is a sequence machine. Um, it's, it's used to recognize sequences more than anything else, uh, whether those sequences arise acoustically, um, visually, uh, or, or otherwise. So um, we have large pipes coming in uh, corresponding to data, um, and we'd like to determine correlations between that data We'd like to be able to recall an image based upon some sound, uh, uh, recall a sound based or a, or a song based upon an image, uh, et cetera. Uh, and exactly how we structure this um, is, is critical and one of the goals that we have in this project. So at this point, I'm going to give you another cartoon. And this cartoon essentially is an example of the kind of uh, hints that engineers can get from looking at, at the cortex, uh, and one of the, the uh, ideas that drove uh, the models that you'll see in just a minute. So this is the primary visual pathways uh, in, um, from back from the retina uh, to uh, the, the, the striped uh, or visual cortex. And as you can see, that, um, that uh, the left side of the brain gets information from both the left and the right um, eye. Uh, it's the left side of, of each of those two eyes, but nevertheless, it's getting information from both. Uh, it gets mapped back to the lateral geniculate. You can sort of think of the lateral geniculate, um, and if there are any neuroscientists in, in the audience, they'd probably uh, object to this, but you can sort of think of the lateral geniculate uh, as a kind of image buffer. Um, though there's a good deal of processing that happens not just at the lateral geniculate, but even earlier, um, actually on the retina. Um, from a computational point of view, uh, the, the people who design or design, the people who try to elicit and understand the circuitry of the brain um, have, have mapped uh, it into various components that perform operations on, on images uh, or, or, the, or images and the uh, the mappings from images uh, through various processing uh, things. So the retina maps back to the lateral geniculate, which maps all the way back to the back of the brain and the striated cortex. Uh, and then it branches out to several other uh, areas uh, in area two uh, and the um, uh, medial uh, temporal cortex. Um, the notion of uh, a, a visual field uh, is, is most often associated with the uh, areas of the retina and as they map back onto cells. So uh, the, on the far left, uh, the green nodes are supposed to correspond to rods and cones. Um, they map back to uh, what are called bipolar cells uh, and they uh, uh, back to retinal ganglion cells. And at each point you can see uh, that cells are taking in information uh, from uh, cells in the layer in front of them. Uh, and as you get further and further back from the periphery of the body, uh, the, the cells essentially are agglomerating data um, from a much larger uh, section of, of the retina. So the visual field, as it were, you can either think of it as the set of cells in the layer uh, closer to the periphery, uh, or you can think of it as mapped all the way back onto the uh, original visual field uh, at the periphery of the body. And as you move further and further uh, along the visual pathways, uh, the cells are capturing larger and larger portions of the overall visual field. That is, they're computing features of, of the images that constitute a much larger visual field. Um, the cells, uh, especially in, in the lateral geniculate, um, many of them are referred to as simple cells. Uh, they're, they're anything but simple. Uh, and those cells are said to be simple because uh, they it can often be likened to, to computing something like a difference of Gaussians, where essentially um, the, the regions of the visual field, so uh, each one of the square boxes on the left 
uh, corresponds to uh, an image of the visual field. And then the, uh, uh, the uh, ISO lines essentially are, are meant to be the third dim dimension, uh, indicating the amount of, of intensity uh, or the, the response of the cells in that portion of the eye. And so um, the, basically, the, uh, for simple cells, uh, the, the receptive field maps into portions that are always um, in one, uh, per performing one type of comp uh, computation, either doing a difference um, or uh, uh, enhancing the data that they have or, or uh, just the opposite, um, reducing the intensity of the data that they see. Complex cells um, are different for a number of reasons, but the most fundamental one is that Whereas in a simple cell, um, the, the, the type of uh, phenomena that it responds to um, is typically centered. Um, it has one orientation. Uh, it has one position in the visual field. In complex cells, they respond to that same sort of, of phenomena no matter where it appears in the visual field. So for example, uh, in, um, it, in simple cells, that uh, what are called center surround cells, the one that we showed in the top uh, on the previous slide, Essentially, what they do is they're looking for a, 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 a high-intensity dot surrounded by low-intensity uh, cells. Um, you can uh, a generalization of that is uh, is that you can respond to a bar of light um, or a bar of dark um, surrounded by uh, sheets of white uh, on either side. So, in a simple cell, the bar uh, may be at a particular orientation, uh, but it's always centered in the visual field. Uh, in a complex cell, uh, the bar can be positioned anywhere in the visual field. So obviously, complex cells um, are, are able to handle a much more complicated kind of inference. And in particular, uh, they are able to uh, essentially respond invariant to the position of the type of phenomena that you're looking for, uh, the position in the visual field. And there are a lot of them. Um, so in fact, most of the cells uh, beyond uh, the striated cortex uh, are uh, are of this sort. So um, now we have the data moving back to, uh, again, back to the picture that we started off with. Um, the information that is computed in the visual field, in visual area one, uh, is essentially orientation information. So it's determining uh, the orientation of little bars in the image field, um, or, uh, or half planes in the image field. Um, and you get both information from, from the left visual field and the right visual field. And in this case, um, I'm asking the question, uh, given that there are cells that respond to these things, and some are coming from the left and the right, how might they be organized uh, on the surface of, of area V1? You could imagine a checkerboard. Um, you could imagine um, slices as shown in the middle. Or you could imagine some other uh, topology. Uh, in fact, uh, given that it's called the striate cortex, you might guess that it's the one in the middle. Uh, and indeed, that's exactly how uh, the striate cortex is organized, uh, with bands of corresponding to the left visual field uh, and bands corresponding to the right visual field interspersed. And then within each one of those bands, they're cut up uh, in terms of cells that are tuned to specific orientations. So the box on the bottom, uh, essentially, uh, is uh, a, what's called a hypercolumn. Uh, it's an anatomically distinct portion of the brain. Um, and what it's actually doing, uh, apart from the left and right portions, um, it's computing, uh, its output indicates uh, one of those cells is basically going to light up and say that there's a bar um, in that particular portion of the visual field, uh, and its orientation is um, one of those uh, increments from uh, 0 to uh, 180 degrees uh, in 10 degree uh, variations. So that's a, a unit in some sense. Um, it's anatomically distinct. Um, and you can also think uh, that, uh, that it's obviously computationally distinct. That's essentially the level that we're going to be using um, as a random variable uh, in the models that we're looking at. Uh, and it's well enough studied and well enough understood that even though it's a noisy um, uh, a characterization of uh, the, uh, the angle of bars that are positioned on the visual cortex. Um, it's a pretty good um, abstraction to use. So 
that's the cartoon. Um, oh, and this actually is uh, a, uh, uh, a the, 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 the black uh, visual field on, up in the upper left-hand corner corresponds to uh, an image that was shown to a monkey uh, that was otherwise paralyzed. Uh, and I was only uh, allowed to see out of one side of its visual field. And um, they then took the poor monkey, um, injected a dye in it, uh, and then um, uh, basically killed the monkey and, uh, and, and took a look at the, the resulting portions of the striated cortex. Uh, and you can see the pattern uh, distinctly uh, on, uh, imposed on the striated cortex, even seeing the, the little um, interruptions in, in the lines that constitute the, uh, uh, the visual pattern. So back to the model of, uh, of Lee and Mumford. And uh, what we want to take is take this model, um, assume that, uh, that the x's, the x, uh, the outside observation, the x's corresponding to visual area one, visual area two, et cetera, uh, correspond to random variables. Um, the ones lower on, uh, we have a fairly good idea of what they might correspond to. In particular, they, they allow you to detect lines. Um, at somewhat higher levels, they compose lines uh, to get uh, sort of longer lines. Um, and if, for example, you were looking at drawings uh, or at cursive text, um, the, uh, the higher levels would, would compose those lines uh, into uh, more complicated lines or, or lines with angles in them or cursives or portions of, of, uh, of written text. Um, the, the model that was uh, discussed uh, in the Lee and Mumford paper uh, was relatively abstract, uh, and it was primarily used as a basis for, uh, for explaining uh, various uh, data from uh, performing operations on, uh, on humans um, when they're in, uh, being operated on, uh, and there is a medical reason in order to probe, um, but also, of course, uh, in, uh, in monkeys, which are the primary method for, uh, still for, uh, uh, for looking at uh, 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 cortical behavior. So the, the basic idea that, that, in some sense, the cortex is a, um, a generative model, uh, that it can be described as a graphical model or a Markov random field, uh, is, is fine, uh, but if you're talking about a graphical model that is on the order of the size of the cortex, you're talking about millions and millions of variables um, and, and a very large number of connections. So what kind of learning algorithms would suffice uh, for that kind of a model? There's been a lot of, of, of work on artificial neural networks in the past, uh, and so um, many of the ideas that you're going to see uh, in the following uh, have their roots in, in earlier work, but in some sense they, they've, they've found a more a clear uh, instantiation in the form of graphical models for the reasons that I mentioned before, uh, that the graphical models have the gold standard of having a clear and concise uh, semantics in terms of a joint distribution over all the random variables. So I'm going to give you a concrete example. Uh, and uh, the example is uh, we're going to build a, um, a generative model uh, to recognize digits. And so uh, in this case, the digits uh, come from a, a database that's comprised uh, of some 500 um, uh, people with each of them uh, writing um, a few hundred different uh, instances of their uh, digits zero through nine. And the, the images were compiled by the National Institutes of Standards uh, and Technology for the purpose of having a competition um, so that we could, so that they uh, could find a, a vendor uh, or a company uh, to provide the, um, uh, the, the pattern recognition uh, uh, software that the post office uses to, to recognize zip codes. So uh, these are essentially, um, they're, they're simplified in the following sense that the digits are centered um, in um, 28 by 28 images. Um, they all have 8-bit depth. And uh, uh, they are 
uh, scanned in, in in sort of the standard uh, standard way. Uh, oh, and they're also light and dark adjusted so that basically the luminance is the same uh, overall. The brain does an extraordinary job in dealing with uh, variation in luminance. Um, if you can just imagine the, 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 the problem of being inside your kitchen uh, where it's relatively dark, reading a newspaper, walking outside, um, uh, and continuing the whole time uh, to, to follow the, the story that you're reading, um, that's an extraordinary feat um, with several orders of magnitude uh, uh, change in the overall luminance. Um, so we're finessing some, some problems uh, that are obviously hard, uh, but um, there's still plenty of problems left to be had. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to build uh, the same kind of generative model that we saw for our cartoon of recognizing buildings, um, uh, distinguishing uh, garages from houses. Uh, and uh, the model is at the bottom, essentially, uh, going to be have enough random variables to, uh, to cover uh, the image. So the image is 28 by 28. Uh, that's 784. Uh, so at the bottom level uh, of this cortical model, we have 784 random variables. As I mentioned uh, in, in the cartoon, the idea of, of generative models is that they're compositional. So uh, the features at one level are composed into sort of meta features at the next level. And uh, at the very least, uh, unless you learn the structure, which we're not going to do right now, um, you have to define how the features at one level map to the features at the next level. And so what we're going to do is we're going to divide up the uh, 28 by 28 images uh, into 4 by 4 regions. And that constitutes 7 by 7, 4 by 4 regions. Uh, and uh, I did that relatively arbitrarily the first time. Um, and uh, uh, the, the model that results is the one that you're seeing here. We also can define whether or not the receptive fields at one level overlap with one another um, or not. Uh, and in this case, we're going to indicate that at the lowest level that the receptive fields don't overlap, um, that they are, um, that they, they cover, uh, they, they basically partition the image into these 49 regions. Uh, but at the next level, um, they do share information. Um, and the reason that we want them to share information at various levels uh, is that we think that there are correlations between portions of the image at one level um, or portions of the image uh, in one region and the adjoining regions. Um, and as you go higher and higher, um, those kinds of dependencies between uh, adjoining uh, visual fields uh, allow you to encompass uh, a concept that, uh, that encompasses the whole image, in this case, uh, the designation of a digit. So uh, the software that we've developed uh, allows us to, to specify uh, what's generally called a, a pyramid graph Bayes net for obvious reasons. Uh, you specify the number of levels, uh, the way that the receptive fields at one level map onto the receptive fields at the next level. Uh, they're not always purely pyramidal. Uh, they can be truncated pyramidal, pyramids, essentially. Uh, because uh, you, it's not the case that you always want a single feature uh, at the top. In this case, we do. Uh, the top level feature is going to correspond to the classification of whether we're looking at a 0 or a 9 or a 5 or a 4 or a 3. So the one on the left, um, you can see it has uh, no dependence. It has um, uh, the receptive fields at the bottom level uh, overlap 1, uh, and, but it has no um, intra-level connections whereas the one on the right is exactly the same as the one on the left, except it has interlevel connections. Um, and there's a lot of subtleties about uh, the use of those interlevel connections um, and the degree to which they help in the recognition process. Now, typically, when you learn a graphical model, you use uh, an algorithm called expectation maximization, in which you, you essentially start with uh, a, an assignment to all of the parameters of the model. Remember. When I showed you the cartoon initially, I told you that I specified the parameters. In this case, we don't know uh, that we, we're assuming we don't know anything about the concept. And so we want our, um, the, 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 the corresponding cortical model to learn about the features of, uh, the, uh, of, of the, the phenomena that it's looking at, namely uh, the writing of, of digits. 
uh, and we want to compose those automatically. So we have to learn those parameters. And in EEM, essentially, uh, you set all the parameters initially random, uh, and you perform a form of gradient uh, ascent or descent uh, in order to, uh, to adjust those parameters to get them closer to a local maxima uh, rather than a global maxima. And often, that's, that's quite good enough. But when we're talking about models that have uh, millions of variables, that turns out to be very difficult indeed. So what we're going to do instead um, is we're going to learn the features from the bottom up. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of developmental studies that indicate that that's exactly what, um, what humans and, and animals in general do. Uh, they learn those features, and those features um, uh, uh, go through, uh, basically follow you for the rest of your life. Um, there are great examples, great examples of extraordinary cruelty uh, in which they've taken cats and they've put them in rooms in which there's only horizontal lines. Uh, and they've raised them uh, for three or four weeks. Uh, and then they've exposed them to environments in which there are things other than horizontal lines. They cannot see uh, the vertical lines. Uh, so, and, and they cannot learn them either. So there are certain levels of, of our visual processing uh, that, that once you have one opportunity, essentially, to, to learn them. Um, so you've heard lots of things about the plasticity of the brain. Uh, but there's also some areas in which um, it has great difficulty sort of uh, going back and filling in the details after they, uh, the opportunity has been lost, or for one reason or another, um, you've had some sort of a lesion and you've lost that ability. So uh, at the bottom level, uh, remember I said that these are 28 by 28 images. Uh, they have 8-bit depth. As far as I'm concerned, 256 values, uh, that's a continuum. Um, so uh, I'm going to model them as though they're continuous variables. Uh, and I do something called a mixture of Gaussians, uh, which you really don't have to understand uh, how this is meant as an audience for um, uh, as a general audience. Uh, but uh, I'll give you sort of a graphical depiction of what we're learning in this case. So remember, at the bottom level, um, each of the nodes uh, takes in uh, a 4 by 4 or 16 different pixels, each one of them being 4-bit um, depth. Uh, and here's an example of the kind of, uh, of features that uh, the mixture of Gaussians learns. So uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, you see the 16 pixels. Uh, and this is after learning, after we've, we've basically shown uh, the, the cortical, the lower left, lowest large portion of the cortical model, the model, thousands and thousands of digits. Um, and what I've done here is in order to depict sort of what's going on in the learning model um, is for each, uh, I've, I've, I've set pretty much arbitrarily, I've said that, that the random variable uh, can take on 12 values, um, the random variable at that, that level. The level below it, um, there are, again, a, a vector of 16 real values, but we know they're 0 to 255. So what I then did was, in the same way that I mentioned that I could take a generative model, I could fix the value at the top, and then I could sample it, um, uh, I've done the exact same thing at the bottom level, as though I could probe into uh, the cortex uh, and get some idea of the readings that, that follow. And so what I did was I sampled it 100 times. I probed it 100 times and got 100 samples. Um, having fixed it um, at one of its levels. And what you see on the left uh, is the summary of those 100 examples where I've stretched out the 16 pixels um, in, uh, from left to right. And then for each of the, the possible values, that, that uh, the 12 values that it can take on, um, I've shown two little graphs. One is the one where I've stretched it out and shown all uh, 100 values. And the, the little box uh, next to it what I've done for that, I've taken the average um, of all 100 samples. Um, and then I've just depicted it as uh, the, the little piece of the visual field with the third dimension coming out into the screen uh, corresponding to um, the, 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 the average of the intensity for all those values. So what do those look like? What's it learning? It appears to be learning to recognize bars uh, in various orientations. It's distinguishing between those. Um, so the one in the upper left-hand corner, um, that's a, uh, a, a vertical 
uh, uh, bar. Uh, uh, same for the one below it. Um, let's see if you go to the to the one such as this, uh, you see it's a 45 degree uh, angle, uh, and you're getting some idea of, of what the, the system is able to pick up um, by looking at these various images. So the way that learning proceeds uh, is it starts at the bottom of this hierarchy, uh, and just as I showed for the cartoon at the outset, in order to quantify the entire model, you have to have the conditional probability for every variable given its parents. So essentially, you have to learn that. Uh, so the way that the algorithm works is having learned the bottom level, um, it then uses that in order to generate samples uh, for the level above it. Uh, and those samples then are used uh, in order to, uh, to set uh, the variables uh, and, and then perform EM in a little local circumscribed area uh, to, to learn the parameters just for that portion of the, of the, of the image. So at the very lowest level, uh, we're learning to, to distinguish various horizontal, vertical, et cetera, bars. At the next level, um, it composes those in terms of lines. Uh, at the level above that, uh, they correspond to little portions of cursives uh, in, uh, in the written text. The models themselves, um, I said for the lowest level, they correspond to mixtures of Gaussians. The ones above that, um, there are a variety of things I've tried. Uh, the simplest uh, and sort of most straightforward is just to represent them as uh, a, a, a table, essentially a, uh, you can think of it as a truth function. Um, that has a lot of parameters, uh, but in fact, uh, the number of parameters doesn't seem to cause any problem uh, having to do with overfitting, for those of you who know anything about machine learning. So uh, the, the, what you would see is if, if you sort of watch this over time is that um, information uh, would come in from the bottom. Uh, it would initially uh, be fed into the nodes at the lowest level. Uh, it would learn the conditional probabilities for those lowest nodes. Um, and then once those parameters were learned, uh, it would then the next time that data comes in, it would be sampled and propagated up further in the network, uh, and it would work its way up through the network uh, in that fashion. So, I don't even know if this works. So here you see that the, the data is coming at the bottom level. Uh, the ones above it haven't been trained. Um, it's looking at images. The images get fixed at the bottom. Um, and it's learning this in a completely unsupervised uh, manner. Um, then later on, what I do uh, is I, uh, I use it in a supervised manner at the very t by, by fixing the node at the very top, corresponding to the digit 0 through 9, um, for every image that it gets during the training process. And then later, in testing, uh, basically, um, Obviously, I, I don't fix uh, the top node. Uh, I simply use that as uh, the, the most likely output from the top node uh, as the indicator of the guess for the model. So that's the way the basic learning algorithm works. However, if you, if you did what I said uh, and you tried to learn it node by node, uh, you'd end up um, with a, uh, a, a model that uh, was not able to generalize or to move basically to, to, to capture features uh, that spanned reasonable portions of the image. So uh, in order to, to, to facilitate doing exactly that and also to create a level of granularity for parallelism um, that was suited to uh, the kinds of uh, cluster machines that, that we have most uh, available, what I did was the following. Um, for every node in a given level, um, I took that node's parents uh, in the level above um, and uh, the set of children for, uh, for all of its parents. And I took that as, as, a, as a unit, which I refer to as a subnet. Um, I co constructed the subnets um, for every node, uh, and then I composed them in cases uh, where one subnet uh, could be, uh, was completely uh, contained in the other using a, uh, an algorithm called maximal sets. Um, that results for the graph shown here uh, in seven subnets. Um, and the subnets themselves constitute a graph. Uh, and 
uh, all of the learning and inference is performed uh, on the graph as it's shown here. Uh, this results in a much more robust uh, set of features that are learned by um, the overall cortical model. Uh, and it provides the basis for both learning and inference um, where the, the information that's passed back and forth between subnets uh, corresponds to um, uh, marginal distributions uh, that are computed by each of the subnets locally. Uh, just to, to sort of pop up a level uh, and to describe the way that the subnets are, de are composed into larger structures, um, take this as a simple graph, show the, the red graph in the lower left-hand corner, that would correspond to one subnet, and in the cartoons in the following, the little triangles correspond to subnets um, and the circles to nodes. Um, each of the subnets then um, is a unit uh, that comp it consists of anywhere from uh, to 20 to 100 nodes. And remember, these are also in three dimensions. Uh, and each of them uh, is uh, a, a process running on a machine uh, where the output of that process corresponds to samples um, that it generates to send upwards into the hierarchy to use for training uh, the subnets higher in the hierarchy um, or passing down priors or distributions in order to perform inference. There are uh, three different algorithms uh, that we've been looking at um, and one new one uh, that uh, I've been working on just from reading a few of the papers uh, here at Google on the MapReduce uh, a framework that you all have. So the, the easiest one uh, is pointer chasing, uh, and that's sort of the obvious kind of graph algorithms that you might expect. Um, we're also using something called MPI, uh, or the message, message passing interface uh, framework, uh, that's probably the most, the predominant method for doing parallel computation on, on clusters today. Uh, and we have another new algorithm that, that uses a framework called publish and subscribe. Um, Thus, these, if, if you think of the pyramid uh, structures uh, and, and the columnar uh, structure that I began with sort of interposed over it, uh, you can see it's fairly obvious how to, uh, to partition the nodes or the subnets uh, so as to um, uh, allow for parallelism. At, in a given level, all of the nodes or all the subnets can compute simultaneously. And the processing in the next level uh, essentially can wait uh, until all of the inference at that level has been uh, completed. Actually, the inference moves up and down this, this, the, the hierarchy. Uh, but uh, again, for the most part, uh, things can be done uh, in that fashion. So again, back to the, the same sort of toy problem we've been looking at all along. You start off with the structure of the pyramid graph. From that, uh, and this is a slice through the middle of the pyramid graph. From that, you construct uh, the structure of the subnets. Uh, and then you can embed the subnets in a plane uh, in order to, to allocate the processes in such a way uh, to minimize communication. Uh, I'm not going to go through the publish and subscribe. Um, I'll simply um, show this uh, very briefly. Um, that same structure uh, of basically uh, uh, bulk parallel computation, where you divide up the overall computation in, in a level uh, and distribute it among a bunch of processes, um, that fits exactly into the way that MapReduce works. Even though we allow for a slightly higher degree of asynchrony in the case of the MPI algorithms, um, the MapReduce one uh, is, uh, is essentially the same uh, algorithm. Um, with a lot of mystery, of course, um, a good mystery from the programmer's perspective uh, about what goes on behind the scenes uh, with all the inter-process communication. So the, the map portion um, is allowing each of the subnets to perform their computation, uh, which essentially is to run uh, an inference algorithm. Uh, and the reduce essentially uh, combines the, um, the outputs of those and then maps them into the subnets um, at the next level. And so inference uh, can uh, proceed through uh, a, a number of different MapReduce operations, uh, moving up the hierarchy, uh, down the hierarchy, and then up the hierarchy one more time. Um, the, um, 
one of the keys um, and one of the reasons why I think that Google is probably going to be interested ultimately uh, in getting systems that can behave uh, like the Cortex in their ability to do uh, pattern recognition uh, is the ability to handle uh, spatiotemporal features. And I'm not going to go uh, into the details. This is a whole talk in and of itself. But, but cortical models are, that's what they are. They're machines um, for doing pattern recognition uh, on time series. They deal with sequences uh, and, and streams of data. Um, that's what they're designed for. They, they, they extract uh, the, um, or they, they exploit the opportunities of the contiguity of the data in, 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 in time series. Uh, in order to, to perform most of their inferences. It's that continuity uh, that essentially provides them with most of their leverage. So um, some of the, uh, the algorithms that we've developed um, handle spatiotemporal uh, 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 receptive fields. Uh, and the model that we're working on is very closely uh, aligned with a model that uh, Yoram Singer uh, helped to develop uh, back in the late 90s uh, called hierarchical hidden Markov models. Uh, and uh, in and other talks, I, I will go into that in more detail, hopefully when uh, Yoram is back from, um, from, his, uh, from being away for a couple of days. So that's it um, for the talk, and I'd be glad to answer some questions. Yeah. So clustering into subnets, you said it's better. Is that from the theoretical perspective, from empirical? What is that? Uh, that's it? purely empirical. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't do that. Um, it, it, in some sense, if, if the, the, the brain realizes that, sorry for the anthropomorphizing, uh, that, uh, that in a graph, a large, in a, a large tree, there's, there may be a great distance between two points uh, on a given level. And so the fastest way to get from one point to another is to go up the hierarchy, which is relatively shallow, uh, and then back down the hierarchy. And unless you have some way uh, at the local level of agglomerating portions of the data, um, then you can't get the kind of, uh, of connectivity that, that you need in a tree. I mean, you have to have some branching factor. So with no branching factor at all, which is what you do if, if you just use a simple node and its parents, it's branching up, but it's not branching back down, and you need branching both ways. Um, the, the subnet structure where you take its parents and all of their children again um, satisfies that requirement. And larger ones are better, of course, but the larger they get, um, the more computationally complex they get as well. Okay, thank you.